We Americans value deeply our long-standing relationship with the people of China. The Chinese people have been uniquely admired, respected, and liked by Americans, and the historical rapport between the two peoples is now happily the basis of a cooperative relationship. The United States deeply sympathizes with China's quest for greater economic development, her openness to the West, and liberalized economic politics. China's foreign policy will be critical to the global stability in the indefinite future. Therefore, Americans have a continuing and deep interest in her evolution internally and externally. We are fortunate to have with us to discuss China's, China's path, her distinguished ambassador. Ambassador Han was born in Beijing in 1924. He entered the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the People's Republic of China in 1949, serving with its protocol department until 1963. After two years as first secretary and counselor at China's embassy in Moscow, he was deputy director and then director of the protocol department until 1973. He then served as deputy chief of the liaison office of the People's Republic of China in, its, in the United States. <clears throat> as director of the Department of American Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and as vice minister of foreign affairs. He was appointed to his present position in May of 1985. It is my great pleasure to introduce the Ambassador of the People's Republic of China to the United States, His Excellency Han Su. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Peterson, for your kind introduction. And uh, Mr. Frank Bird, the executive director of the Baltimore, Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to address such a distinguished audience. On today's occasion, I wish to talk about China's reform and the open policy as well as its foreign policy. I hope my presentation will offer you some uh, clues to the current development trends in China and the role it plays in international affairs. What are happening now in China? If I'm to summarize the tremendous changes now taking place in China, in one sense, Sentence. It is this, reform has become the order of the day in China. It all started 10 years ago, soon after the chaos of the Cultural Revolution came to an end, when the new national leadership headed by Deng Xiaoping assumed the office, both the Chinese government and uh, people came to see that the gap between China and the outside world has widened after a painful, have widened after a painful soul searching emerged a national awareness. China has to change if it were to maintain its rightful place in the community of nations. And the only alternative which offers hope to China was to carry out reform. The first step of the reform was tried out in China's rural area nine years ago. Why did the reform start in the country? You may ask. 
The reason is simple. As 80% uh, of China's population is uh, rural, its uh, well-being has a vital bearing on the stability and the future course of the whole nation. The rural reform received an initial boost when the government raised by a large margin the state purchasing right, uh, price of farm products to make farming more profitable for peasants. Shortly afterward, the people's commune was dissolved. The farmland, which is still publicly owned, was contracted to individual households for amendment and under a responsibility system. Now farmers decide for themselves how to till the land. This new farming system has been introduced to about 98% uh, of China's rural household. The rural <coughs> reform has worked with only 7% of the world's arable land. China is able to feed and close 22% of world's population. In 1987, China's agriculture registered an annual growth rate of 4.7%, higher than the world average. Hunger and the famine, which was common in old China, has been eliminated once and for all. What is remarkable about China's rural reform is that China has been able to find employment in rural industry for 80 million rural labor force, freed from farming as a result of boosted agricultural productivity. The change is more far-reaching than figures can tell. It means China can avoid the massive influx of rural people into cities in search for jobs, which is an which is a universal phenomenon of the industrialization process that plagues many developing countries. Now, China's rural reform has entered into the second stage. Farmers are encouraged to go into specialized production to meet market demand on a volunteer basis. After this step is taken, China's natural rural economy will go through a profound transition into a commodity economy. How are things with the urban economy? Well, the picture is equally encouraging. The nationwide urban reform was introduced in 1984, which is now in full swing. The objective is uh, clear-cut to replace the old economic structure that was excessively centralized with a new one geared to commodity production to meet market demand. But I must hasten to add that here that we are in no hurry to introduce the capitalist system. As China has its unique national condition, what we have in mind is to maintain the dominant position of the public economy and at the same time instill vitality into it, into it through introducing all the economic management expertise that has proved effective in running large-scale commodity economy. The focus of the urban e economic reform is to invigorate some 400,000 industrial enterprises in the country, which form the backbone of China's economy, so that they can truly become economic powerhouse 
instead recipient of government subsidies. First, the factory director responsibility system was introduced to give the factory management a greater say in running enterprises than and even broader steps was taken. The management of factory is a word to candidates who prove competent through a competitive talent hunting bidding process. After signing the contract, the selected candidate will shoulder full responsibility for business management. This contract in managerial responsibility has been introduced to about 7% of the large and medium-sized state enterprises. The small ones are either leased or to its staff or sold to them on a shareholding basis. Now, Chinese business executives find themselves confronted with a very challenging situation. Either you do well or you have to face the unpleasant choice of going bankrupt. While people in this country are still debating the merit and demerit of business acquisition, the Chinese have found it quite effective in enhancing productivity. As a matter of fact, it's now quite common in China for a state enterprise to acquire another one that has gone into red. I am sure even many China watchers are stunned by the emergence of, uh, in China of the familiar yet unthinkable phenomena. I would be amused to learn how they would react to such newspaper headlines at the opening of stock exchange market in Shanghai. And uh, although this last year in October, there is a, a crash in Wall Street. <laughs> and the auction of real estate in Canton, they probably would not have to if they have realized how far the Chinese have departed from the dreaded and the ossified understanding of how to manage a socialist economy. One lesson we have learned from our past experiences is that the government does not have to and should not own and manage everything. Then what should be the role of the government in managing the economy? The general principle is that the government should regulate the market and the market guide enterprises. The main task the Chinese government has set for itself is to create a favorable microeconomic environment for the efficient operation of business. It will regulate the economy mainly by economic leverage such as tax, credit, and price. In the past, the government control over the economy was absolute and total. Thanks to the reform, such control has been reduced to cover only 50% of the economy and will be further reduced to cover only 7% of the economy. The urban reform has yielded substantive results. During the past nine years, China's industrial production grew at an annual rate of 11.3%, and its output doubled during the same period. In fact, more <coughs> was produced by China's industry in these nine years than in all the previous 26 years after the founding of the People's Republic. My presentation about China's reform would not be complete if I do not mention its opening to the author world, which is an important part of its current reform program. 
opening to the outside world once meant a humiliating experience to the Chinese people. China's door was first forced open in the last century by the imperialist powers, which only brought suffering to its people. Today, however, China willingly opens its door wide to international exchanges with the confident awareness that the taking part in international exchanges will help narrow the gap between itself and the advanced countries. Up to this date, total foreign investment in China has grown to $22.6 billion, of which $8.5 billion has been put in productive operation. The number of foreign-funded businesses has exceeding 10,000. Here, I'm glad to note that the United States has topped all the other foreign investors in China with a total investment of uh, $3.1 billion by September last year. All in all, 340 American investment projects have been undertaken in 18 out of 29 provinces on the Chinese mainland. We welcome more American investment in China and hope that it will not be long before American business presence will be established in every Chinese provinces. In China's coastal areas, a belt open to the outside world has taken shape. It covers about 320,000 square kilometers with a population of around 160 million. Four special economic zones and 14 coastal cities has been given additional incentives in doing business with foreign countries. A recent development is, in this regard may be of some interest to you. Hainan Island, which is just slightly smaller than China's Taiwan province, will soon become a full-fledged province with the status of a special economic zone. It will be able to operate in an open environment it has attracted a lot of capital from overseas, particularly Hong Kong. If you are interested in exploring the investment opportunities in China coastal area, please go ahead. <laughs> the Chinese government has recently decided that the economy of the coastal area will become external oriented and that these areas will more aggressively take part in international commodity exchanges. Raw materials will be imported on a massive scale. They will be processed locally by taking advantage of the skilled and the inexpensive local labor force for re-export. I know as a port city Baltimore has an external oriented economy. You may consider setting up factories there to make your products more competitive. Haven't you encountered any problem in the course of reform? I realize this might be one of the questions on the minds of the audience. I certainly don't want to be accused of painting only a rosy picture, and uh, my frank answer is yes. Serving as a Chinese diplomat in this country gives me the advantage of putting our own problems in a comparative perspective, and I have found some interesting similarities and dissimilarities. For example, I have found that overspending and the inflation is not an American monopoly. <laughs> the new benefits generated by the reform 
has so aroused the appetite of the Chinese consumers for durable items that they we they vie with uh, one another in buying them. As the supply cannot meet demand, inflation results. To combat inflation has become a constant headache of the government. On the other hand, while you are con concerned about inadequate investment in business, we face a rising investment fever that threatens to eat up the limited resources in a rather inefficient way. However, we see these problems as associated with the changes that occur when all economic mechanisms are superseded by new ones. They are signs of a growing economy and not a contracting economy. And uh, we are confident we can resolve them step by step. All this sounds very fine and encouraging. However, will China be able to persist in its reform and development efforts? Or will it eventually someday be compelled to revert to its past beaten track? I know this question is always on the mind of those who have followed the developments in China. This will meaning concern, though understandable, is necessary. Let me tell you why. The reform has worked. It has benefited the one billion Chinese people as they have never experienced before. Therefore, the reform has won their wholehearted support. When you have one billion people behind a policy in which they have such a great stake, I don't, ima I don't imagine anyone can po possibly change it. What is more, a, must, <coughs> a most reliable guarantee for ensuring China's current policy has been created with the convening of the 13th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party five months ago. A younger central leadership, which has been just deeply involved, <coughs> involved in and committed to reform, was elected. It can certainly be counted upon to guide China's reform and the economic development forward. What is equally important is the development strategy formulated at the party congress. It was affirmed at the party congress that the China remains in the primary stage of socialism, which lasts at least 100 years. During this period, the major task is to vigorously expand the productive force and the commodity economy. And the implication is that China's open policy will be pursued on a long-term basis without change. China expects to catch up with the medium-level developed country by mid-next century. By that time, there will be even less reason why China should not follow a policy that has so clearly benefited itself. Right now in Beijing, China's National People's Congress, the supreme legislative body of the country, is meeting to elect a new leadership of the Chinese government. A major shakeup and the reorganization of the government ministries are expected to further facilitate the progress of the ongoing economic reform. To modernize China is the most important task facing the Chinese people during the entire historical period of socialism. To attain this objective, it is vital to have an international environment of peace. This is where China's foreign policy comes into the picture. China pursues an independent foreign policy of peace. 
This policy is determined by the fundamental interests of the Chinese people. Peace and development are the paramount goal of China's foreign policy. For without peace, to achieve modernization will be out of question for China. We also believe China's foreign policy for peace also meet, meets the fundamental interest of the world peace. We are con convinced that a strong and powerful China dedicated <coughs> to peace will no doubt help make our planet a safer place to live in. To maintain independence is another guideline underlying China's foreign policy. What is the implication of this policy guideline? It means that China does not enter into alliance or strategic relation with any big power. Being the largest developing socialist country in the world, China carries considerable weight in international affairs. It knows how to proceed in its best interest without seeking protection from others. It also means that China makes its, its own judgment on major international issues on the merit of each particular development. We believe an independent China will serve the interest of world peace and stability. With world peace in mind, China has all along stood for the development or friendly relations and the cooperation with all other countries on the basis of the five principles of peaceful coexistence. These principles are mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, mutual non-aggression, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence. The post-war history shows that when these principles are observed, countries with different social systems can live in amity. When they are violated, even countries of a similar social system may come into confrontation. Therefore, China has proposed that these five principles be made norms guiding international relations. We are glad to see that an increasing number of countries have supported this initiative of China's. We are of the view that disarmament is absolutely essential for maintaining world peace. Therefore, China welcomed the recent signing of the INF Treaty between the United States and the Soviet Union and the easing of tension between them. How about China? After all, China also processed a number of nuclear weapons. I guess people in the audience may well well have this question in mind. Well, China never shirks its responsibility for disarmament. As a matter of fact, from the very first day when it came into possession of nuclear weapons, China declared that its development of nuclear weapons is entirely for defense and that is would never <clears throat> and that it would never be the first to use nuclear weapons. What is more, China has always called for the complete prohibition and the thorough destruction of all nuclear weapons. In recent years, China has taken a series of uh, disarmament steps. Among other things, it has reduced its defense expenditures, cut the size of its armed forces by one million, renounced its nuclear test in the atmosphere, and uh, turned part of its military production facilities to civilian production. All this fully shows chance sincerity for peace and uh, disarmament. As to nuclear disarmament, 
China holds that the United States and the Soviet Union should take the lead in drastically reducing and destroying their different types of nuclear weapons. They should stop testing, producing, and deploying nuclear weapons of all types, both offensive and defensive. After this is done, it will be possible to create favorable conditions for con convening a broadly represented international conference on nuclear disarmament with the participation with all nuclear states, including China. Regional conflicts pose a direct threat to peace. China stands for fair and reasonable settlement of conflicts in the hotspot region through peaceful negotiation without resorting to force. Let me now turn to China's relation with the Soviet Union and the United States. As the interaction, uh, as the interaction among these three countries have major bearing on the international development, they certainly deserve some attention. China and the Soviet Union share the longest land border in the world. China hopes to develop normal relations with the Soviet Union. Uh, this will be in the interest of our two peoples. In recent years, progress has been made in the trade, culture, and the economic fields. However, three major obstacles stand in the way of improving the political relations between China and the Soviet Union. By the three obstacles, I mean the Soviet support of Vietnamese occupation of Kampuchea, the Soviet military occupation of Afghanistan, and the massive Soviet military presence along the Sino-Soviet border and in Mongolia. Why do, they why do they constitute obstacles? Because they pose a threat to China's national security. Therefore, China insists that they <clears throat> they be removed before any more any move could be taken to normalize China Soviet political relations. Gorbachev has on a number of occasions expressed the willingness for improving the relations between the two countries. However, it remains to be seen whether the Soviet Union has made up its mind and how far it is willing to go. I hope it will have the courage to undertake major initiative to remove these obstacles. I would like to conclude my presentation by focusing on the relation between our two countries. President Nixon's historic visit in, to China profoundly changed the global political landscape. Since then, China-U.S. relations have gone a long way. Political context has become a regular feature of our relations, and uh, substantive progress has been made in the economic, <coughs> trade, culture, and educational fields. The growth of our ties has been both colorful and many-sided, and uh, one need one needs some imagination to appreciate the depths these ties has reached, have re reached. Giant Chinese panda has become the endeared fans of millions of American kids. Mickey Mouse and the Donna Duck have uh, captured the hearts of many young Chinese TV viewers including my own granddaughter. To make a frank confession, they appeal to her grandfather too. <laughs> Five months ago, Kentucky Fried Chicken opened its largest restaurant, not in this country, but in downtown Beijing. It proves an immediate success, and I heard 
the price is reasonable. <laughs> the mutual interest is uh, our respective culture is uh, insatiable. Chinese is now taught in many American universities. In China, there are more people studying English than people in this country. <laughs> you will not be surprised if you think of the size of China's population. Today, the United States has become China's largest foreign investor investment partner and third largest trade partner. The immense benefits of our relations has here for all to see. As China and the United States are two of the largest countries in the world, good relations between them are important not only for themselves, but also for maintaining world peace and stability. It's uh, this common interest that has sustained the growth of our relations in the past uh, 16 years. On the other hand, differences also exist. This, I think, is natural, as we have different social system, history, and culture. What is important is that we should respect each other's national sentiment and uh, refrain from interfering in others' in internal affairs. For example, everybody knows that Taiwan is part of China. Yet, some people in this country want to see it become independent of China. Such practices threaten to undermine our overall relations and must be stopped. <clears throat> Several years ago, President Reagan said that China and America are two great nations destined to grow, to grow stronger through cooperation, not weaker through division. I appreciate the vision and wisdom contained in these words. If, despite their vastly, vastly different values, cultures, and history, China and the United States can forge a strong bond of uh, friendship. We can certainly contribute a great deal to turning this troubled world into a better place for mankind. Therefore, I would be most gratified if my presentation can add to our enhanced understanding of each other and help bring our two great people closer in this noble pursuit. Thank you. Chinese concrete conditions. It means we are not 
copy the Marxism, I mean just uh, dogmatically. We have to apply the Marxist principle according to Chinese characteristic. So what we have, uh, we, we uh, direct with, with uh, the philosophy of Marxism, we have to combine with uh, our concrete conditions. Because in the past uh, uh, more than 30 years, we have to go for a lo long time how to apply the Marxism in China, the Marxism in China. So now we have already found uh, our own way. It seems, so we start from, as I mentioned in my speech, we first found we can carry out the reform in the low area. Now we start in the urban area, which uh, our reform is not the, not, the same, not the same as the other socialist country. We have to grow our own way, because China is a country of uh, one billion population. We cannot copy the Soviet Union nor the United States. We have to grow our own way, but in the direction of Marxism. But uh, this is actually what we are doing is a great experiment of mankind. We have uh, all, we want to organize the people's commune. We found it's not workable, so we dissolve it. And now we are, we feel we are already on the correct track. I mean, how to develop our commodity economy under the state planning. So this is uh, something uh, new. And uh, also, in many other fields of respect, also, you can see we will find a solution through, a, uh, through the facts. For instance, as, uh, to how to solve the issue of Hong Kong. And we find a formula that's one country, two system. We keep Hong Kong as it is. At the same time, keep the mainland China, China mainland, I mean the service social system. So there are a lot of uh, way, it's uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, fact proof that we apply the maxim not dogmatically, but uh, in combination with the Chinese characteristic. Yes, sir. Follow my Mr. Ambassador, last year I had the pleasure of spending a month in your country. I find the people very kind, peaceful, friendly. I had a wonderful time. I recommend a trip to anybody. Your country is a member, I mean, permanent member of, social, of the um, Security Council of the United Nations. And you have stated how much peace your country wishes for the world. In view of this, I'd like to ask you this. A, can you explain to us your supply of missiles to Iran, missiles that have been used against neutral targets, including U.S. targets? B, your recent sale of missiles, long-range missiles to Saudi Arabia that can be equipped with nuclear heads, warheads. C, as a permanent member of the Security Council, you might be involved in a peace conference in the Middle East between the Arabs and Israel. Instead, how can you be a party to that when you don't even recognize the state of Israel? There are two questions. The first is, would you comment upon the sale, uh, China's sale of uh, missiles to both Iran and Saudi Arabia? And secondly, would you comment upon um, the implications of your non-recognition of Israel for participation, your potential participation in a Middle East peace conference? First, on the question uh, as a uh, alert that uh, we are selling arms to, I mean, uh, missiles to Iran. Uh, 
And uh, we didn't directly sell any missiles to Iran before. And, uh, <clears throat> but we cannot approve that uh, what uh, we have sold in the international market, uh, international weapon market, I mean the missile, uh, to be flown into Iran, because that's beyond our control. But since, bef since uh, the resolution passed by the City Council 598, we already start even <clears throat> to sell the missile to the international market in, all the, in order to prevent this uh, missile to enter Iran. So we are, by actions, we prove that we are supporting the resolution of uh, 598. And even the United Administration admits that we, they haven't discovered we sell any further missiles to Iran. And to our sales of uh, missile to uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, that's the end the request of the government of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. China has supplied conventional and non-nuclear tactical ground-to-ground -ground missiles to Saudi Arabia. China neither favor nor practice nuclear proliferation. China has not sold any nuclear weapons to any country. We trust the commitment of the Saudi government that these weapons are entirely for defense. So we believe this will also for the security and uh, the peace of that area. As to whether China is going to take part in the international conference, since we have no relation with Israel, we have expressed to uh, Israel uh, foreign minister that if uh, they don't want uh, China to attend this conference, we're willing not to attend. If they are willing, well, of course we, are, we want to uh, take part in the international conference. Is uh, if that's a precondition, we believe uh, it's not yet mature. We have to establish our relation, different relation with uh, Israel. Uh, <clears throat> on the inter on the Middle East uh, co international conference, we take a uh, positive actions, try to persuade. I mean, the party concern to be. Uh, objective, because we understand this international uh, conference is uh, dealing with the Palestinian area. So we believe the Palestinian, I mean the organization, I mean PLO, should have the right, equal right, to attend the conference. So we have expressed our clear position on the on this issue. We really want to see, I mean, this area to be peace. And all the country in that area should have the right of existence. And all the, and the Palestinians should have the right to restore their national rights. And uh, to have a sorrow and uh, all the occupied, <coughs> all the occupied Arabic territory should be returned to the Arabics. So this is our fundamental position on the Middle East. Yes, sir. Your Excellency, in your country, only those Catholics who participate in what your government calls the Patriotic Catholic Association may practice the Catholic faith. Fortunately, your government, and I want to thank you for that, has started to release Jesuits and other Catholics, sisters, priests, and laymen, loyal Chinese who practice the Catholic faith united with us, us here in America and around the world through the Bishop of Rome. Will this trend of releasing Catholics from prison in China and from house arrest continue? And when may we expect
expect to welcome Chinese Catholics back to their rightful place in the worldwide family of the Catholic Church. Would you comment upon the position of Catholics in China? <laughs> First, I have to make clear, you know, the China, the, according to our constitution, Chinese people have a freedom of religion. So all the people have the right to enjoy, I mean, the religion they want to believe. And uh, so those, uh, but those who violate the law will be sentenced to certain, I mean, uh, uh, sentenced. This is according to the law also. So as you, you mentioned, I mean, whether we are going to release the imprisoned uh, fathers or the sisters, we have already released a lot of, uh, I mean, fathers and uh, sisters when they, I mean, uh, <coughs> committed, I mean, also proof that they are, uh, uh, the, what they did before, I mean, is a uh, violation of the law. They have been released. And uh, <coughs> as to why China is, uh, I mean, carry out this uh, uh, Catholic uh, in their own way, we are, we want to follow an independent uh, course. I mean, in uh, this, uh, uh, we, we, we call this as independent, uh, uh, independent, uh, 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 organization of uh, the religion. So we don't want to other uh, foreign, <coughs> foreign, religion, foreign uh, power to interfere our internal affairs. And uh, all the people in China enjoy the freedom of religion. And uh, we also have uh, all kinds of uh, religion not only Catholic, but also Christian, uh, Islamic. All these uh, religions enjoy, I mean, their freedom in China. Uh, so we have to divide religion, freedom, if there exists. And at the same time, not well like the law. If well the law, this is different from the freedom of religion. So this, I hope you can also understand. on before, but I wonder, uh, other than uh, welcoming China to possibly be the largest English-speaking nation in the world in the near future, <laughs> but I wonder why in your comments about peace, uh, China feels it necessary to become one of the larger arms suppliers to the world. Uh, why not just provide arms for your own armed services and not sell them to the world? Would you uh, comment upon the policy of China? with respect to international arms sales? Uh, <clears throat> uh, we did sell uh, some arms to the world uh, the, because maybe our arms is uh, uh, not so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but China is not the largest one. China, I think, uh, the United States to Union and uh, some other countries that are the first. We only sell certain arms to uh, countries who want to take uh, self-defense of their sovereignty. So we, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's why we sell some arms. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for honoring us with your presence. I would like to ask you about Tibet. First of all, um, by what right did uh, China invade Tibet in the 1950s? And uh, illustrating the 
points of government which you have brought forth. The Human Rights Commission has uh, talked about the genocide that China has been committing in Tibet, including in the present time, three men on trial for death. And uh, would you please comment on your policy toward Tibet? Thank you. The uh, third question is, uh, would you uh, justify China's uh, movement into Tibet in the 1950s, and secondly, comment upon what has been termed a kind of genocide within Tibet. First, uh, China is not invading Tibet because Tibet is part of China. Just like when you send your army to uh, Alaska, you, we, I cannot say you invaded Alaska. So because that's a part, Tibet has been part of China since the 13th century, before Columbus touched his foot on this continent. So long ago, Tibet was already a part of China. As to the so-called genocide, that's uh, not uh, the truth. Because there are a lot of rumors saying how, how many Tibetans have been Killed. That's not true. Because before 1959 in Tibet, the, there is a serve system. All the people in Tibet have no human rights at all. All the, the land are treated as animals. Only after the founding of PRC, we abolish the serve system. So the people in Tibet <coughs> recover their human rights. This is a big ach achievement. Nobody wants to re restore the third system in Tibet. I think this is uh, very clear. So the human rights, actually China, the new China, I mean, regards the human rights in Tibet, I mean, the first place, actually, because China, uh, new China abolished the third system. And uh, as to whether there, uh, I, I, because I haven't read the news, but I do know uh, around uh, October, uh, let me see, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, there is uh, some people, I mean, uh, in Tibet, while in the law, I mean, just uh, make force to try to kill, kill and uh, kill policemen and uh, only injured policemen. 